Okay, uh, let's get started. I see more people than last time, <laughs> uh, which is good. I know uh, some of you are probably, but it's an elective, so I don't know why you're forced to attend or even take this class. So, uh, but anyway, um, so let's uh, uh, get to what's what's the objective for today. So last time we saw uh, mostly versioning. So we saw MLflow, which is for model versioning. And then we saw uh, a tool called DVC, but that's not the only tool. There are like, you know, probably hundred tools like that uh, for data versioning. And then we also saw um, some nice mix of Git that we saw two lectures ago and uh, something called GitHub Actions. Okay, so when we tried the CML, as and that's not the only tool, also to do what is called continuous integration. But it was a it was a like a very handy example to see how to trigger some downstream um, uh, compute to happen for testing or other things. Um, so CML was a tool that we used, and uh, that was a nice example of using Git GitHub Actions or I guess the vendor GitHub uh, providing these ways to kind of uh, trigger downstream jobs, okay? Um, so today what we're gonna do is uh, touch a couple of uh, other topics in this bucket. Um, so where are we, right? So we are, I guess, uh, pretty close to um, your presentations. Today is uh, this lecture, so we have one more lecture. So I'm trying to uh, cover one topic, uh, one bucket of topics today, and then another set of topics next time. Uh, and as I said, this is really not an in-depth course. First of all, a two-grade course in just eight weeks to study all sorts of you know um, tools related to model building or machine learning is not easy. Uh, so what I'm showing is just an example of some basic tools. Um, and uh, you uh, and the last two lectures are also supposed to be informative to everybody else in terms of the tools that you have chosen and uh, want to demo okay so um so that's where we are and uh i will yeah what do you think about the deadline for the code and the, uh, code? the deadline for let me come back here actually uh you want the deadline to be changed how many people want the deadline to be changed and why is that <laughs> uh so this is the um so this is to kind of avoid the advantage for the first set of groups versus the second set of groups. If you change the deadline, then based on feedback or based on <laughs> using other people's presentations, you're gonna potentially do better, isn't it? But What's the fix for that? Have you seen this before? <laughs> right, I just wanna ensure that the second set of teams which will present, uh, are the first set of teams that are present uh, are not constrained. Um, and two groups do not have two sets of constraints, right? Two sets of students. Um, we didn't know one thing about it. What is it's it? on the first day of presentation. Okay. Which is the first day of presentation? It's just the one night before. Oh, one night? Okay, I, I, one week. <laughs> Yeah, so I think so. He agrees with my <laughs> my current strategy right now. Yeah. So you still have to submit the presentation by eighteen. Not for you. Yes. Uh, presentation by no you no. Have one more week to sort of change things and then submit. Yeah yeah. So presentations are not graded. Okay, presentation is just for you know nobody's you know we're not grading people for how well they speak here, uh but. Uh, the only thing that's created is the one that you submit on fourth. Okay. So you can work on your presentation and it's not to kind of uh, uh, fill in a lot of content. It's more about like, you know, what do people understand and what can I tell them about the tool that I've investigated, right? Tool or multiple tools or something that you have investigated. So presentations are just for, you know, basically you're replacing me, but you're basically telling your experience about you know, some tool, I know I, I gave a pretty short list, but there are other tools also you can, uh, especially teams which have not yet picked anything, uh, definitely talk to me. Uh, it's good to kind of get started on some uh, some direction as soon as possible, okay? Um, but now let's keep it this, unless you have a better fix. Yeah. So 
like you're saying that it could be an unfair advantage, right? For the second, yeah. Second, but for the people who present first, the second people will look at that and it could be an unfair advantage for them. Sorry, it's an advantage for the second set of group. Yeah, yeah. the teams that are presenting first, yeah. they would basically look at their presentations and then they can. Yeah, but presentations are not graded. Yeah, so neither the slides nor the not your presentation uh, content will be graded. Um, but you know, it's a, as I said, it's an experimental topic. It's kind of, first of all, does MLF fit in a business school? We don't know. But uh, it's an experimental topic, and you guys chose to kind of learn more about it. So don't be stressed about uh, this aspect. Okay. Um, anything else? Actually, I was gonna since you brought up projects, I actually have a couple of example presentations that I have to uh, I want to show, but I don't want to get into the details of the content. But I wanted to show you a couple of uh, groups which did this. Uh, not maybe not uh, you know in the previous uh, times it was presented. So. Uh, let me just talk about the, you know, how they did it. I mean, it was pretty much, you know, everybody has their own creativity of how, how to set this up. So don't get super influenced by this, but they were looking at a particular tool called uh, ZenML. Um, we're not worried so much about the tool, uh, but the way, you know, they split it up into two parts. What did they do? Uh, and what was the tool about? Okay, first let's talk about what the tool was about and then what did they do, right? Um, so first, I guess, few slides. Um, are about what is the tool and what does it do? Um, like, I know they give a lot of information and sometimes they put words which most folks won't understand, don't do that, okay? Uh, try to keep it simple uh, from, like really, if you're telling your manager, what does the tool do, right? They don't wanna know all the nitty gritty details, but they wanna know at the first order, where does it, what value does it add? Uh, not in terms of business value, but like what value does it add in your workflow or something like that, right? So uh, here there's a talking about, you know, so by the way, this tool is not the only way to structure any, any of your tools. Every tool and every project or every use case will be different. These guys, um, uh, this particular team, they looked at a particular tool that helps with multiple aspects of a ML uh, development workflow. So that's why they were discussing, you know, how this tool fit, fit into some, some workflow. Uh, they also did some comparison uh, with a couple of other tools. You know, they had some time or maybe it was already, you know, maybe they're in the documentation of this particular tool. So they just brought that out because kind of summarizes what other tools are in the space and uh, things. By the way, this is, uh, again, uh, there are a lot of words here, which uh, at least in the lecture we have not covered. So it's not a good idea to present these types of, uh, you know, uh, words that need explanation. Okay, try to keep it uh, very simple and clear of what the tool does in plain English. Okay, that's that's really preferred. Okay. Uh, and then, as I said, the first part, they wanted to introduce the tool, the context of the tool and what it does. And then they started talking about um, uh, what did they do? And in particular, they, I guess, used few more, you know, few more components uh, like MLflow actually. Uh, it, it apparently works with the tool, this tool. So they showed how uh, they kind of tried out MLflow and some other things. Uh, within the context of this tool, okay. Um, I mean, they're talking about their objective and so on, but um, actually, in their in their details, also, I think again, they're going back to what the tool can do, but ra uh, rather than what did they do, I would suggest focus on what did you do rather than all list all the breadth of uh, features that a tool or something like that has. Just focus on what did you do, okay? What did you try? And what did you learn from it? And if it's interesting, that will be good for other people to know, right? So like MLflow, for example, you don't have to be uh, you know, in a professional setting to use it. And as long as you keep, you know, as long as you're training at least three or four or even five models, it's good to have a nice UI that, you know, when you click, it will show the uh, loss curve and everything nicely, even in your own projects and stuff that you do, okay? Um, so that, that's the takeaway, right? So in the sense that all these tools that we're getting exposed to, maybe there's a very small subset of tools that we can actually use it today. Like Git, obviously, you know, it's not related to ML, but you should start at least getting used to the concept of versioning of code, just like versioning of documents. That, that's something that you should pick up uh, when you can, right? Um, so anyway, they, went to, they go into details of what they tried, um, some data skew and things like that. Uh, Okay, so that was their presentation. It was a little bit more about the tool and less than less about what they did. Uh, let's look at the second one, which is uh, 
the second presentation just to kind of give you a sense of it's a completely different tool so that you're not only valid about you know thinking about a flask or just deployment of models or anything like that that's not the only you know uh, bucket of things you should do in your project right um so this one is about image annotation i know there are some i think there's at least one group which is looking into some annotation type of a uh, uh, tool. Uh, so this is image annotation. This is actually a very popular tool called CVAT, uh, computer vision, I guess, annotation tool. Um, so here, this is, this is a different team. They're looking at, okay, they want to say, what is the tool about? Okay. And uh, then they get into what they did. Okay. So they're, they're light on, I mean, you know, the one sentence description of what the tool does, it just lets you annotate data. Okay. In this case, image data. And then they're talking about what did they do uh, in terms of, okay, they looked at how to install. Uh, they looked at how, you know, they apparently the installation script has like Docker container based uh, spinning up of this thing. So they show, you know, that this is how they did it. And, uh, you know, this is how you see the login screen. And, and so they're just talking about their experience of working with this tool. Um, and, and and so it's, it's light on the text, which is fine, but you should be able to explain like what is going on in each, uh, each slide, right? So uh, here they're talking about how the how with that tool they're able to like load a picture and like uh, draw some you know classes and annotations you know uh, with images. So I hope this uh, gives you a sense of like a couple of uh, you know uh, examples of what people have done um, in terms of their presentations. Uh, but these you know I I'm not saying that either one is good or bad or anything. Everybody has their own creativity of explaining uh, the uh, their what project they've done. Uh, but really the goal is to keep the text not complicated. Don't use words that are uh, maybe listed in the documentation or whatever, but not understandable by, you know, others without looking at the documentation. You just want to tell like, in, you know, in the first order, this is what the tool does. This is what the gap, you know, this is where it fits in a workflow. And uh, this is how we have, you know, experienced trying it out. Okay. Any questions about this? Uh, Okay, we didn't, don't focus on the content, okay, on, on the styling and all that. That's just uh, extra, um, yeah. Okay, so any uh, questions, general questions on the project, uh, general questions about the project? Is the report also due before the presentation happens? The report is the only thing that due before the presentation. You said code and report. I mean, when you report, like for example, this tool doesn't have any code, right? I mean, this is just a UI for annotation. Yeah, so for you, you should submit a sample code, I mean, uh, that you have done. Oh. And how big should the report be? Like, what are there, the is things? A, there is a page limit and uh, uh, things like that, details in the project page, yeah. So basically you can keep it short. Uh, I mean, obviously if you have screenshots, then they might, they might fill up. So. If that is the case, then have an appendix with lots of screenshots, but they should be legible. Okay, not don't just keep screenshotting things and then have a huge uh, PDF. Okay. Um, um, anything else about the project? I mean, so, okay, so I will, as usual, uh, I've been trying to do this, but I think last time there was lesser time, just an hour. But again, this lecture also, I'll give some time if you have decided a project, but don't know what else to do with, you know, you've decided a tool, but you don't know how to kind of, are you stuck with some basic installation step or something, you should talk to me. We can try to fix it in the second half of the lecture. Okay, really the first half of the lecture is just to get, go through some demos and uh, you're not expected to be masters at like replicating exactly what I'm doing in the class, okay? There are notes, helper notes, but as I said, the only source of truth is the documentation of those tools. Okay, so last time MLflow, just go to MLflow's website documentation and look at the getting, getting started guide. In fact, we'll, today we'll do some other getting started guides just to give you a sense of these tools are complex behind the scenes. Okay, a lot of people, a lot of software engineers and so on have worked on you know getting that functionality. And so if, and some of these open source, like some of the links that you're seeing, and if you actually explore the code, it's pretty complex, okay? But we are not here to master or any, you know, understand the code structure or anything. We're, we're just users, okay? And, uh, to, but to use a tool, even to use a tool, you need to at least understand the getting started and like what are the components, you know, pip install X, Y, Z and um, get things running, right? So that's, that's what, that's the exercise we want to do. So if you couldn't follow what I did in some of the previous lectures, uh, revisit the tool that we looked at, like DVC or MLflow, and just look at getting started, okay? Um, and also, so therefore, if you have stuck on the project, 
uh, if you're stuck on uh, tools that we've seen so far, uh, or including today, uh, we can we can discuss that um, uh, during the second half. Okay. Um, any other co comments or questions about that? We can always discuss separately, as I said, uh, after in the second second half. Okay. Um, if not, let's uh, get into our uh, content for today. So uh, we are in the second bucket, and what we've been looking at is uh, I, I'm I'm calling it model lifecycle management. But last time we saw versioning, which is the second bullet point here. Uh, we saw MLflow, DVC, and CML. These are some example names of tools. These are not the only tools, as I said. Um, today we'll try to look at uh, scheduling and A/B testing. Okay, uh, both of them are actually pretty complex topics, depending on which tool you pick. But as I said, our strategy is to get exposed to, we already know what scheduling is, but we'll kind of try it out on our machines uh, uh, with one or a couple of tools. And then we'll look at A-B testing again. Uh, A-B testing is a pretty complex topic. Um, you know, there are actually multi-million dollar companies uh, here in this space, uh, but we'll try to at least understand uh, from an operations point of view, as in like, you know, infrastructure, ML infrastructure point of view, uh, what, what goes into, a B testing. Okay. So, and if you have time, we'll also try out one uh, tool of the trade, which is, uh, I didn't write it here, but it's PyTest. Let's put it. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll add it later, but we'll look at PyTest. Okay. I mentioned this uh, earlier. You need to test your code. I, I mean, our code base is really bad in that sense. Our MLOps code examples repository, or even the any, any repository, actually. Most of my repositories are, don't have uh, testing um, code, okay? But it's very, very important, especially if you're sharing it with other people and it's, it's actually, and you're live, you know, you're responsible for your code, then you should be actually doing testing, uh, okay? So, yeah. So let me just jump to the... So a bunch of slides here, and then I'll go to the notes as well. Uh, but okay, let me actually go to this slide, uh, two slides, and then I'll go to the notes uh, to explain a little bit more. So as I said, uh, we'll do, so in the first half of the lecture, or basically even less than that, we we'll look at two types of tools. One is about scheduling and uh, you know trying to deal with recurring jobs. And the second one is related to testing. And in our case, it's going to be not, not just PyTest, but A-B testing. Okay, So maybe I'll flub them together as something to do with testing, but A-B testing and PyTest are different uh, object, you know, have completely different objectives. Okay, So let's talk about scheduling first. So scheduling is, uh, as the name implies, you know, it's a recurring job, uh, just like your computer, you know, on, on schedule, it probably looks for updates, right? Your operating system or any of the tools that you use, uh, Adobe and other things. Uh, they have a way to kind of uh, do something repeatedly, okay? Uh, updates being one common thing. Uh, but for example, in the ML uh, world, we, not just ML, but anything to do, anything data science-y, uh, there is gonna be extra transform and uh, loading uh, uh, steps that happen at pretty uh, frequent uh, intervals. Uh, I mean, unless your, your data is static and it never changes, um, okay? So there are steps in just the data munging part, uh, which might, which most likely need to be repeated on a very frequent interval. Okay. Similarly, model training, as I said, uh, although the first set of lectures were talking about replying one snapshot, one point in time model, but there's not going to be one point in time model, and there's going to be models getting retrained with fresh data, right? So uh, how do you do the retraining automatically? Um, that's another type of job. And then, you know, if model, uh, you know, we, although we were exposing the model itself in the first uh, few lectures, uh, sometimes you don't even have to expose the model itself. You can uh, actually pre-compute for each uh, feature or uh, groups of features, like each customer type or each customer segment, what should be my recommendations? What should be my, um, you know, predictions? And you can pre-compute them and store it in a table and you can just expose the table, okay? So you don't have to always expose a model. Uh, you can always expose something which, you know, it's basically saying I can pre-compute for every feature vector what the prediction is and just have a lookup table. You know, it says lookup table is a function, same thing as a model is a function. And so there you have every feature vector and then a, a prediction for it, 
okay, like recommendations. So it, this makes sense for prediction, what is it called, recommendation type of problems where you would have like uh, customer segments. And so if you don't want to have, re, you know, really high quality model, uh, then you can just say per type based on recent data, what's the trends of what people are doing. And based on that, you might have a ranked order of articles or products or things like that you can show. Okay. So for that, you can just use a, a database, for example. Okay. Um, so how do you do that? Uh, so today we'll look at a couple of tools. One, the first one is called CronTab. Uh, it's from 1975. Okay. So it's almost uh, 50 years minus two or uh, 48 years. Um, right. So it's a pretty old tool, but we'll use cron and cron tab is just a, is a way to edit that, edit some configuration related, right? Uh, it's a tool that's available in most, uh, Linux based systems, Macs, uh, that you can use to schedule, like, let's say you have a Python scraper, which scrapes uh, headlines of a, a news website, uh, right? You can actually write that scraper and instead of manually calling Python file name.py, you can actually say, okay, uh, every day, uh, at nine in the morning, scrape this and reformat the data and, and show me uh, some summary, right? You can do that uh, on your own laptop, okay? Um, so cron is a tool that is available on single machines generally to schedule processes on those machines themselves. Uh, in contrast to that, one, one, of the spec one end of the spectrum is cron, which is a single machine thing that generally is mostly you do it uh, to schedule process on your laptops and single development machines. On the other end is a tool like uh, Airflow. Okay? Airflow is just a name of a, uh, scheduling tool, which kind of helps uh, with scheduling thousands of jobs. Okay, so you may say, okay, which company has thousands of jobs? There are a lot of companies actually. So Airflow is a tool that was released by uh, Airbnb uh, back in 2015. So it's already eight years old. And if you go to Air Airflow's website, or you know, there there's a company behind Airflow. It's called Astronomer. Uh, you'll see like every company that you can imagine, uh, like even you know, hotel chains like Marriott to uh, car companies like Volvo and you know, things like that, they all have they all have used some version of Airflow or equivalent uh, to manage their uh, recurring process, okay? And uh, the second example, second uh, name here that I've put, Google Cloud uh, Cloud Composer, is just a managed version of Airflow. So Airflow is an, uh, Airflow is an open source tool. Uh, there are multiple competing entities which, which will give you managed version of these things on AWS or Google and so on. So, um, but we'll look at Airflow next, okay? So those are the two tools. Uh, that I want to uh, just uh, show you how how they work. Any questions here? Scheduling of any job. Uh, there are tools to schedule any job. We'll just schedule. We'll just see how the scheduling works. But they can be scheduled. Yeah, scheduling any job. Yeah. So, I mean, we can schedule model training as. Well, right? Yes. 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 As I said, uh, here I just showed these are the jobs you could schedule, but you can schedule any Python function, not just Python function. Let's say you have data in an S3 bucket in. Um, Amazon and you want to push that data to Snowflake, actually Amazon and Snowflake have vested interest in providing glue code and helper code for you, as for example, with Airflow, so that you can schedule this transfer of data from S3 to uh, Snowflake in an easy way. <laughs> okay, so many, many companies actually write, uh, I guess, what are called providers uh, for Airflow or some sort of you know extra code so that you can actually um, schedule things, okay? not just... Uh, uh, Snowflake or Amazon, but there are many other companies. Um, so I want to switch to Cron, which is, I don't know. If, yeah. Okay, so I don't, okay, I think I'm doing some other stuff. Let me just skip here. So here I'm doing a lot of things, but let me just discuss the cron part, okay? So just, I didn't want to copy this into the slide, um, so I'm just using the notes for a second. So as as I said, it's a really old tool, uh, but it's a service. It's just like you know, it's a program that can help you schedule other programs, okay? Now actually, there is a just as a tangent, there are actually programs, uh, Python packages, which let you schedule things uh, in foreground, okay? Foreground versus background just means that uh, if you schedule something at 9 a.m., uh, everything is asleep, no program is running, and then at 9 a.m., uh, cron will trigger that program to run. Okay, a foreground foreground process means uh, you have your Jupyter Lab. Let's say you started it and you ran the pro Python program. Uh, the program is executing continuously and is waiting for some time to occur. Let's say 9 a.m. in the morning, and then it will execute one statement that you prefer you wanted to execute. Okay, 
So, but there you, it's like the program is running and you're not, you know, you, like you're not getting a prompt back, for example. Okay, so it's a, it's a foreground process. Um, there are ways to schedule foreground things, like for example, um, email scheduling, right? Email scheduling would be uh, something like a cron type of an activity, uh, but uh, you can you can also do email scheduling via like a foreground process. Okay, there are packages in Python that let you do that. Anyway, that was a tangent about foreground versus background. Uh, but cron is a uh, not specific to Python. It's just a tool available uh, with uh, many operating systems. I guess Unix-like systems. Um, foreground essentially is something that does happen in Python run of your life. So for example, if you can use the email scheduling, you can do that using VB also. Right? Yeah. You can see the process run. Is that the foreground process? So cron is the thing that is running throughout. Uh, foreground just means, foreground versus background just means you get ready to get, get back the prompt or not. <laughs> Control to do other things. Okay, so within foreground, we don't get back the control and background, we do get back. Yeah, I mean, cron is a way to just, uh, you know, I guess you can look up the technical definition. It's just a, yeah, background means you, if you could schedule a background job, you still get get, get back control to whatever you're doing, right? Um, yeah, it's just, I'm using it informally. So uh, we should look up some technical definition later. Um, so I guess an interesting tidbit, it's from the Greek word chronos, uh, meaning time. Um, so, so cron is that utility, and we'll play. We'll kind of interface with that in a second. The way to interface it with is via another program, just like Docker client and the Docker daemon. Here, there's a do cron daemon. Daemon is the word for like a always running server or service listening to requests, listening to your commands. Okay, so cron tab is the uh, CLI or command line utility uh, um, to actually set up the tasks that you want cron to execute, uh, cron to call at certain points in time. Okay, so for that, I actually want to just directly skip to a a, a website called crontab guru. Uh, it just shows you how to uh, kind of, you know, what does this editing of, what does the scheduling of jobs look like? As I said, cron is the program, uh, is the daemon or server service. Uh, cron tab is a way to say which programs run, like the configuration basically, or give commands. And, uh, uh, and this tab that I opened is just trying to show how to, how to specify uh, a, a job, okay? So, uh, for example, here, uh, generally how you specify these things is via five, uh, you know, uh, numbers um, or five numbers and some other choices. For example, here, uh, these five uh, characters here with some one, one spacing is basically entered as one line in a simple text file. Okay, so tab is just literally maintaining a text file where each line will have numbers like this. Okay, so spaced uh, five characters. Okay. So this, uh, the way you read it uh, is uh, like this, right? As, as it shows below in the legend. Uh, so five space four means first of all, fifth minute of the fourth hour. Okay. And uh, three stars. And this convention, by the way, you <laughs> decided like long time ago, 50 years ago, almost. Uh, so obviously it may, may have some suboptimality and so on, but, um, and then stars just mean, yeah, all for all hours, for all month, for all day, uh, for all week. So this, this is, this is the convention. Yeah. Every day on the fourth hour. Right? Yes, yes. Uh, so every day, every month, every day of the week, uh, you at the fifth minute, uh, you run something. So what do you run something is uh, something that follows after the space as well. Okay. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that's, I guess, was easy to explain. And there are some more complications. This is one way to do it. Uh, here, actually, this website is basically for you to try out, you know, okay, what if I do... Um, Like at every minute, run something. Right at every minute, poll uh, like a website to see. Okay, if uh, you know some seats for a music festival opened up, you can write write that here, right? And if it opens up, then send me an email so that you can actually go and book those tickets. <laughs> you can do that here, right? Uh, but uh, all I'm saying is, if you are you know if you have to run, if you are the only dev uh, or if you're only data scientist in a team, and you have to do you know you are responsible for training models, you're not going to manually like, okay, put a calendar entry and do manually like train, you know, Python train.py or something. You don't have to do that. You can actually, if you can automate some of these things, it will free up your time okay, to do other things, right? You can actually just uh, schedule it. Okay, Obviously, 
you can have uh, in your Python code uh, asserts and errors uh, that you can catch. And if those errors happen, you can actually, you know, there are actually packages which will let you trigger back to uh, communication uh, tools like Slack or Microsoft Teams, or even email you uh, directly that, hey, some error happened, go and check, okay? So uh, you can do that. So in, with this tool, you'll have to do all that manually. Uh, in Airflow, uh, there's a lot of extensions and so on uh, because it's a pretty uh, heavyweight tool. Uh, people, you know, have written extensions. I mean, companies have written extensions that you can just uh, set it up and it'll work. Okay. Um, any questions about this? We'll just run a simple example uh, with this uh, and, and then talk about Airflow. No questions? Uh, then you should just jump into the... Um, uh, code examples directory. And uh, I just started the Jupyter lab right before the class. So it's the same virtual environment since uh, lecture one. Um, I think it's called a cron example, and it actually doesn't have anything interesting going on there. Uh, let's actually see. Um... Okay. Um, it's just saying you know, how to set it up, right? So it's basically saying open the cron editor through cron tab. And uh, so the way you do it is uh, cron tab minus e, e for editing, and you can you have some extra command line options to delete all the previous um, you know scheduled things that you did. Uh, so you can check that uh, as well, and it's basically saying just write this file. So I'm, the way I've done it, this example is all star. So it's saying every minute uh, run a particular job, okay? and and the path is not correct, so I'll have to change this. But uh, other than that, you know I can edit this and actually. Um, uh, run this job. So let's see what that job is also. So I use the command less as a way to look at the file. Uh, there are a couple of commands like this to see the file. Obviously you can double click in index editor and also see the same file. Okay. So uh, the other one is cat. Um, um, so the job is actually, uh, it's a very simple job is saying, print the date and this double arrow just means uh, print, not just print the date, but also save it in a text file. Okay. Uh, not just say, but append to a text file. Okay. So actually let's run it manually, right? So what does date do? Uh, it says this is the date, right? So all I'm always saying is push it to a uh, location. So let's actually uh, do the previous uh, thing. So let's open a terminal. Um, so I think minus help perhaps. Yeah, uh, it's it's not a complex utility, right? It's just a text file. You wanted to uh, make an entry and it also tells you what format it is. So it's only either edit, list, uh, delete, or uh, do something, okay? Prompt if you're doing something. Uh, I'm basically deleting the stuff. So let's actually edit it. Um, so first time you run it, it's I wanna ask which editor you wanna use. Uh, in my computer, there are like three or four editors. Um, let's just use um, two, okay? So this is the uh, file where you we need to put that entry. And in fact, it gives you an explanation of how, what is, you know, it gives you a minimal example of how this works, right? So it says uh, each task has to run, define a single line, and uh, you can provide concrete values for the minute, hour, day of the week, uh, sorry, day of the month, month, and day of the week. Um, and then, uh, you know, output of cron tab jobs is sent to, uh, sent through email to the user of the cron, email to the user the cron tab file belongs to. So I'm, you know, my username is Teja here. So if my email was actually configured, it can actually send email, uh, but it's not configured. So the setting up of that part is more complex. So let's just add that, uh, Command that we said, um, right? Um, let's see where the actually where is our. So this is where our uh, file is. So let me just uh, use that. Slash. Um, Right, uh, and that's it. So if you have not tried Vim uh, or Nano or one of these tools, 
it doesn't, I mean, just to edit basic editing, I think it's worthwhile to spend five, 10 minutes to just learn what the minimal commands are, how to edit a line and how to exit and how to enter, okay? Uh, because cron tab, uh, it's not easy to, it's unclear to me how to use a GUI text editor or something to use it. So I would suggest use that. So, okay, so we added um, a line uh, and we'll come back and see if it if it worked and if it did not work, we'll fix it, okay? Um, any questions about cron? Where do you get the text in text file? Like in that form? Or it can be like any text file? Oh, well, the text file. So that's what. So cron tab is controlling a text file. And the only way to edit, you know, set up jobs is through the cron tab uh, minus E. Not the only way, but the way to do it is to uh, use cron tab minus E to edit that file. So, that uh, file, you can't edit it outside of, uh, at least I'm not shown it here. There may be ways to get to the same text file in a roundabout way, but uh, this is the standard way. And so, so the download of cron tab will get like the default text file open. Yeah, which it controls. So you don't you only interface it through the through through its edit. I mean through by calling cron tab minus e. Okay. And then for all the jobs, you need to use that same text file. You cannot have like multiple text files within one user's cron tab. No, I mean, yeah, generally one user setting up like five jobs, it will be five lines, right? Within those, you know, you can write a dot sh by the way means a shell script. So that is also can be just one line or could have like 10 different uh, commands one after the other that will need to be done. But yeah, it's not like separate, separate files or separate, separate types of uh, jobs. And where is this thing? When we set up Franca, where are we sort of taking the inputs from and where are we going? This is all local to the machine, whichever machine. It could be a remote machine, like your server, like EC2 machine, or it could be currently my local machine. So how, uh, how does it recognize that? It doesn't. So it only knows what's local to it. Okay. Yeah. So so that's why I'm, I wanted to show two ends of the spectrum. Cron is just local. Uh, so it was invented before, I guess, the internet, right? So it's yeah. mostly for uh, single machine uh, situations. Although you'll find the same interface uh, same way to specify things, even with uh, modern tools, uh, like this way to specify uh, timing and all that. Uh, but this is an old tool for like single machine things. So if you are a solo data scientist or data engineer, and you just want to run something and you know, you literally have login access to that uh, machine uh, for running recurring jobs, you can just set up a cron, a cron uh, job instead of some complex, you know, beast that you will have to maintain. I mean, yeah. So, Actually, um, okay. so this is where, I mean, I, we saw, right? It was in this tilde just means the home folder, uh, you know, so slash home slash Teja for me, but it could be in Mac also, it's, it's gonna be the same thing. Um, uh, so basically that's where the fi this file got created. Okay, like for example, uh, I don't know. Yeah. So this file, uh, what's the time now? Uh, got in, I guess got edited now, but uh, so this file is a new file that got created because we are pushing the date uh, values, appending the date values into this file. Okay. Before we started the cron job, this file was not there. Okay. So, so you can imagine doing the scraping operation, right? Scrape, get some value, put it in this file, for example, uh, scrape some like stock price or something. Uh, and in fact, you can uh, cat that file, right? Uh, till uh, slash uh, date uh, job. So it's been, I guess, four minutes since I started the cron, uh, I guess, cron schedule. So it's uh, so it's printed up four numbers. Okay, four rows, sorry. I guess four lines. So, I mean, same, it may seem pretty underwhelming and easy right now, but it's a, it's a very powerful tool for scheduling things, just like email scheduling right? on, or on Google, Gmail or Outlook. You can schedule emails, right? Uh, very similar to that. Uh, so you, you can be creative in how you're gonna use it personally. Okay, uh, so let's actually switch to the second tool uh, in the same category for scheduling, which is called um, uh, Airflow. Okay, so I just want to show a couple of graphics and then uh, get to some demo. Okay, so Airflow is uh, exactly, um, you know, at least in the core of it, it's exactly this for the same purpose. It's just, just to schedule a job. 
Uh, but Airflow does a lot more than that. It lets you schedule multiple jobs with dependencies between them and gives you a nice way to store the metadata related to every time the job is run, uh, whether the job failed, uh, you know, uh, call people or whatever, uh, downstream things. And also uh, has a nice UI where you can visualize how things are dependent on each other. Okay. So if you think of business process improvements uh, with humans, just think of business process improvements with tasks. Okay. Maybe a training job is running for a long time, which is causing delay in predictions, which is causing like, you know, bad recommendations to go because, you know, there's a huge delay between when users' uh, data is collected and when you're getting recommendations, then you can figure out, okay, maybe that job is what we need to next, you know, our data team or our data engineering team has to focus on. And that's where you, if you can make it efficient, bring it down from, let's say six hours to one hour, then you can actually get some gains. So all I'm saying is, uh, it's a, Airflow is a tool to kind of visualize complex uh, see collections of jobs with dependencies between them. And the way you do it is through what are called directed acyclic graphs. Okay, This is a directed acyclic graph. Directed because the edges between each square, you know, each green thing over there uh, is, is, a, is a directed edge. And, uh, you know, it's not, there's no cycle here. Okay. Uh, cycle means, you know, edges going uh, one point or the other. Okay. So there's no cycles. It's directed and it's a graph. Uh, and so most, uh, they're, they're I guess core idea is uh, we'll represent uh, these types of graphs for all the types of processes happening in the company, not just ML. It could be it could be non-ML jobs, um, and uh, and then figure out where the bottlenecks, where are the uh, you know places to improve uh, and things like that. Okay. Uh, actually, this is you know even with this figure, I can tell you that uh, people can bring in all sorts of tools. The moment you have directed recipe graphs, you can bring in all the I don't know if some of you have done networks network science or networks based course, social uh, networks type of course, uh, you know, here there are only like seven or, yeah, seven um, nodes, but if you had 700 nodes, which is totally possible, okay, um, then you would like to know uh, centrality or what is the longest path, the shortest path and things like that, okay? So you can actually just bring in all the network science stuff once you have graphs, okay? Um, so this is an example of a DAG and we'll see a director cyclic graph or a DAG uh, in a second. Uh, so what is, uh, like, what are the moving parts of an airflow, uh, system, right? Uh, airflow is a software and it, it actually multiple things going on, multiple components in there. So let's uh, go from, um, uh, 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 the left side. So there's a bunch of, uh, what they're calling as workers. Workers are just think of them as extra compute. Like maybe, um, uh, workers are basically processes, but they can run on not just one machine. Unlike Cron. Uh, think of scheduling a training job on a GPU machine and a, a data fetching job on a, a machine which has like a Snowflake license and things like that, right? So you can, and also uh, something else. So you can actually distribute, you know, workload across uh, across uh, workers. Uh, but this is like, you know, Airflow's job is not to distribute, uh, do distributed computing. Uh, it can talk to these guys to actually get work done. Okay, that's it. So you have to obviously uh, determine which machine does what. Uh, that's workers. Airflow's core thing is actually uh, the scheduling and executing. So uh, if you see at the bottom, there's this uh, DAG directory. Just it's just a folder. It's just a collection of uh, directory acyclic, acyclic graphs. Okay. So and in fact, that folder, uh, each of these acyclic graphs is just um, described in terms of a Python file. And we'll see an example by the way. It's just a Python file which just says, okay, do job one, then do job two, then do job three, or you know some variation like that. Okay. So. Basically, Airflow's job is to look at the directory and uh, see how, uh, you know, what is the frequency at which these jobs need to run and what are the dependencies. Read that information, and you know, uh, the scheduler and you know, a subcomponent called executor actually run those things at those times uh, using the workers. And it could also run on the same machine also. Okay, and we'll see the same machine implementation now. Uh, but the cool thing is, it also logs everything about the about the jobs every run, basically DAG run. Uh, in a database, and it's think of it as just an application database like Postgres or MySQL or SQLite. I don't know which ones you've seen in uh, uh, advanced databases, uh, but basically a regular application database. And then it also provides a web server where you can actually see which job ran when, how long it'll take, uh, what's the uh, Python specification that led to uh, that uh, directory recipe graph, and so on. Okay, so that's what uh, Airflow is, and. Uh, I guess let me stop uh, talking more. And 
instead of going to Airflow, Airflow has its own getting started guide. Instead, I'm going to use a um, a company's guide. In fact, uh, this company uh, is called Astronomer. It, these are the guys who are trying to commercialize Airflow. So it's just like um, MongoDB. I don't know. MongoDB is a uh, NoSQL database. So there's a MongoDB that you can install, obviously. There's also a company which uh, provides a cloud-based, um, I guess, managed service. So they also you know, have a getting started introduction to Airflow. So we're just going to go through this instead of airflow.org um, getting started. Okay. Um, so as I said, uh, I want to kind of wrap up this discussion about Airflow and actually get into the demo. I said Airflow was uh, uh, started in 2015. And uh, why, did, why did they start, right? So basically, they were struggling to manage, uh, manage data. Okay. So in fact, uh, Airflow is literally focused on data related issues rather than you know overall general software uh, issues. And that's why one of the reasons why it's written in Python and Python is used to kind of describe what's related to what. Okay. Um, so let's look at you know why use Airflow is you know author, schedule, and monitor workflows. And this is uh, just exactly what we what we said, right? So you need to write what, what depends on what schedule them and also monitor whether they succeeded or not, right? Um, it has a lot of uh, lot of other things that you could do. Um, yeah, there's a lot of examples. Uh, I don't want to get into uh, details right now, except for the getting, you know, like the simplest example, but you can see all sorts of companies that you might recognize, some of the companies that you can recognize, TensorFlow, Tableau, um, Slack, Snowflake, you know, all these are big companies in the ML off space, uh, uh, maybe not Slack itself, but all I'm saying is these things are, uh, um, you know, uh, can be, can talk to each other via Airflow scheduling. Okay. I mean, Airflow doesn't do anything to make these things talk. It's just schedules uh, jobs on these individual services. Okay. So let's actually, uh, okay, let me just mention the four things. Uh, before I show the demo, DAG, uh, just to re recap, DAG is a directed SHG graph. That's how you specify job dependency. A DAG run is a particular instance uh, that you ran through that sequence of jobs. Uh, okay, execution. A task is one step in a DAG, like one job. Or we have been using the word, I've been using the word job, but it's a task. And task instance is the execution of a specific task as a specific point of time. Okay, so those are, that's, that's pretty much the vocabulary that you need. Um, with that, let's actually uh, do a uh, actually this is uh, pretty complex, I feel. Um, yeah, I think this is the one. I, instead of the quick start, I wanted to get to uh, this one. Okay, so the way we're gonna try out Airflow is uh, not directly installing Airflow. That's also very feasible, and you guys should try it after you know after I show this demo. But I'm going to use a tool that uh, uh, this company has built called, uh, I guess, Astro CLI. So we're going to run. We're going to pretty much do these steps uh, except the last. So we'll start a Airflow environment locally, and my Airflow environment just means uh, you know what what they want to do is just like the way we were doing with Python environments. They want to keep it clean. So uh, this, this, they have a tool, uh, which sets up an airflow environment just means that they're going to instantiate a few Docker, uh, containers. One container will have the Postgres database or whatever, some SQL database. One container will be the web UI and one container will be the scheduler or executor or something. So all I'm saying is they will take care of, uh, the cleanliness in terms of like an isolated environment. Okay. Uh, and, uh, uh, we look at a DAG, you know, basically an example DAG. And we'll just execute it, okay, through the UI. That's it. So we're not doing everything that it's saying. We'll just uh, install this tool and uh, spin up an Airflow locally, an Airflow environment. Look at a DAG and run it. Okay. So for that, um, we do need to install the tool. Uh, and uh, since the tool works with Docker, uh, and that's where I guess uh, you need to have Docker uh, at least installed on your machine. Um, and it's saying you, you might need like an editor and stuff, okay? And Python environment as well. So 
So if you have installed the tool and uh, how to install the tool, uh, I will not get into. It's called Astro. I mean, you can actually just search for how to install uh, Astro CLI right here. Okay. Um, I think I don't want to reshow it because I've already installed it. I, it's not, you know, it's not something complicated. You just run one command, and uh, if you trust the company, then it's okay because there is a sudo in the command. Uh, but if you don't trust the command, it's actually a Go binary, so you can actually go back to their GitHub page and just get the Go. Uh, it's a, it's it's a binary written in the Go language, and you can just run and execute it. Uh, you can execute that. Okay, so. Let's actually go to uh, lab. So I might. Uh, yeah, I think I already have Airflow installed. Uh, actually, let me check. Um, yeah, it's actually, I already started it. Let me ignore that. Um, Okay, uh, I'm gonna make a, a directory called example. I already have two examples, let me make another one. So I'm gonna create an example. I, this is just for me to organize, so ignore the paths. Um, so example three, there's nothing going on here, okay? So you just wanna create an empty directory, and then if you have installed the Astro CLI, then you just have to type Astro, um, I guess, start, dev, sorry. Yes, dev in it. Okay. So that's uh, you just run a couple of commands. So Astro dev in it will initialize this directory with Airflow related files. Okay. Uh, the important file that we care about is a file a folder called DAGs. That is where we'll write a Python file for every uh, job, uh, not job, sorry, uh, every collection of tasks that we want to run. Okay. We'll, we'll actually focus on that in a second. So uh, let me. Go in here and uh, let's very briefly. Okay, it's not, it doesn't have anything. I think it's a pre compiled uh, uh, Docker image. So there's nothing going on there. So we have these files. Now, what we do is uh, Astro, I guess, start. So so we have so Astro tool kind of reads the Docker Docker file and and gets those gets the image and spins uh, the Docker um, setting setting up. Okay, so okay, oops. So it's raised an error because previous uh, previously those ports are already being used. Okay, so let me um, actually don't have to rec recreate it. But if you if you run this for the first time. If those ports are free, you will succeed. I already have uh, one running. Um, I can go and um, disable it, but it's it's not you know it's, it's uh, net effect is going to be the same. I already have a uh, start, so I have a Docker environment running. So with that, um, let me go to that page. It's just. Um, so Astro by default gives a username password. It's just admin admin. Um, okay, so by default, this is what you'll see. Okay, so this is the UI component. Just remember in that um, slide, I had like a few things. So this is the server that we're interacting with. Okay, and uh, DAX directory is something that we will uh, see and we, we can add a file, for example, and so on. And uh, a database and stuff is behind the scenes. Uh, in fact, you can see that um, here, if you do Docker PS, um, so here you can see names like web server, uh, scheduler, uh, Postgres, and so on, and trigger and so on. So those, that's behind the scenes for it to kind of um, manage these separate containers for data, okay? Now, um, let's come back here. There are a couple of DAGs that are uh, listed here. So the way to run a DAG is actually, I mean, if you want to manually run it, I'm just for the time being decreasing the font size, but you can you can just play in each row and it'll run that DAG, okay? So if I, for example, um, press, you know, just start button here, uh, it's actually running the 
uh, running this particular DAG, which will open in a second. Uh, these four circles here represent whether the job is queued, sorry, not a job, the DAG is queued. Uh, did it succeed? Did it run? Uh, is it running currently or is, did it fail? Okay. So let's look at this uh, example uh, DAG. And uh, let's look at the... Uh, this is this is that task. Okay, the, in the in the slides I showed uh, with some extra things, but here is the um, three three tasks in this DAG. Okay, it's just linearly connected, so it's a very simple one. But you can imagine uh, much more complex uh, DAGs here. Um, and uh, in fact, you can actually look at the code. Uh, we'll we'll jump to the code in a second. But this is the DAG, and uh, How did we get there? It's just uh, you know we clicked on the DAG name, and that's why we have this tab of uh, what is the, what does the graph look like, or uh, when did it work, and things like that information. Okay, so it's just a nice UI to log everything about your previous runs. Like for example, uh, it's just showing it was run four times, and uh, every time what happened. Okay, it all succeeded. That's why it's all green here. But if it did not succeed, there'll be a bunch of red dots and things like that. Okay. So it's a nice UI. I mean, they they thought about how to present this data so that people actually can manually intervene and restart a particular job, particular task inside a complex thing if needed and so on, right? So now let's look at the code uh, because remember our whole objective is to schedule jobs I and mean, schedule these three tasks. So for that, we need to say when to, when to, when, when should this be run, right? So let's actually see, um, it's not the easiest formatting here. Um, but let's see how this is set up, right? Um, this is the same three job, one after the other, or three tasks, one after the other. So there's a simple imports, JSON and uh, Pendulum. Pendulum is just, a, it's like a date time, okay? It just gives you a sense, way to uh, get the date and uh, time delta and things like that, okay? It's like very similar to data. And so from Airflow, you just need two things, um, a DAG and uh, the DAG object and the task object. These are actually just function decorators, okay? So um, here's so we haven't discussed function decorators, but this is something new, uh, new in a sense, new since Python three point I guess eight or something. So it's worth looking at it. Uh, this is a function decorator. Okay, we have seen it in Flask as well, right? So in Flask there was the rate app dot root uh, below your function. So if the root is hit, then the function is called. Uh, that was for Flask context. This this one this decorator is gonna wrap this function with some extra functionality that is needed for scheduling, okay? So you can see uh, this DAG has a nice, uh, you know, very interpretable, uh, I guess, API, right? It's saying schedule, when do you wanna schedule it, okay? Here it's saying at the rate daily. Uh, if you look at the documentation, there are many ways to say, you know, how to run, you know, if you wanna do it every minute, you can do that as well. And it's just saying, okay, from what time onwards, you know, we need to start running this every day. Okay, those are the only two in information that's generally needed. And actually you, you can also retry, okay? This is not something that you can do in cron natively. Uh, you can actually retry if the job fails. Maybe it retried because of some contention, resource was not available, whatever reason. Um, and so after the function decorator, here's the function within which there are a couple of uh, nested functions. So remember functions are first class citizens in Python. Uh, so within the example like basic function, which is just getting decorated by the DAG, uh, wrapper there. Uh, there are three functions. Three functions correspond to three operations that we want to do, uh, or three uh, tasks that are there in this in this pipeline. So there is a uh, transform, there is a, a extract, and there's a load, right? So these are just, I, I mean, just for illustration purposes, there can be anything here, like a train, a Python train function. So it doesn't even have to function, right? So in that function, you can call, it can be inside the function, you can call actually, you know, using Python subprocess, you can call something. But also there are other, ways to call a, a third party program to run at different times. Here, since you're not using third party programs, we're just calling a Python function to run after the previous function is done. So that's where this code is simpler. Um, it doesn't get more complex. What I'm saying is this is the structure for any of these DAGs things, okay? Um, and that's it. So three functions and there's a function decorator, very similar to the DAG uh, function decorator which makes these tasks and so you can log it. Uh, so Airflow can log it and then you call, uh, at the end you just call the uh, function, okay? So Airflow picks this information up and uh, given this information, it learned that this is the, uh, you know, sequence, this is the, you know, these are the tasks. 
and uh, and it logs everything about how they run. Okay, so you can click on logs and see you know what happened uh, and stuff. Uh, any questions about this? So my objective with Airflow is not to go into all the features. It's, it's just you know it's a very complex tool, but I just wanted to contrast two tools, Cron and Airflow. Cron is uh, pretty simple. You just focus on one line, and you know as long as you can schedule things. Uh, you know, you manage, you know, uh, errors and things like that. Here, there is some support for like retrying and so on. Uh, this is a tool for uh, bigger teams. You know, there's a UI, there's actually a database and that database might need its own reliability and so on, right? Um, uh, so there may be a DB administration team perhaps. Um, and there's also, you can schedule things across processes, across different programs, across machines, okay? Uh, so that's something that you can enable here. So this, is a tool that's like uh, at a very different scale, okay, very very different end of the spectrum. Um, okay, uh, any other comments? I've been speaking quite a bit. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's not dependent on Docker. They this is just for Astro as a tool to kind of spin it up in Docker. Uh, we can just install. It, it's as simple as pip install Airflow. Yeah, you can just do that as well. No, no, so that's that's just for this tool to kind of set up a nicely containerized, nicely separated, segregated airflow system for you without affecting anything else in your system. Yeah. So you can just uh, pip install airflow and you'll get airflow installed and then airflow in it and airflow run type of op operations to get exactly the same thing. But then it will be uh, in your virtual environment, but it'll also write, yeah, I mean, that's also a valid way. I mean, in fact, that's the way recommended by the open source tool. This is just the company behind that open source tool. So we just went through this tutorial instead. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I was hoping to cover A-B testing, but I'm going to do something simpler. I'll just briefly review PyTest. And PyTest, I'm not even going to review. It's just a five-minute uh, quick uh, intro. I know most of some, I don't know some of you, have. You, has anybody used PyTest before? PyTest. Okay, so then this is like the most useful thing you can get out of this course in addition to Git. Uh, testing is like paramount, okay? So you have to test your code. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, you'll be caught like, uh, you know, you know, you have to wake up in the midnight and then, you know, fix things. You don't want to have those things to happen. So uh, testing is kind of prevalent in multiple, uh, uh, I guess, you know, every programming language, you know, um, so including Python. And PyTest is not the only way to do testing in Python. There are many ways, many other uh, packages and modules available. In fact, Python standard library has a, a module called, I think unit test uh, is the name of the module. You can just use that if you want. Uh, but PyTest makes life a lot simpler, okay? Uh, so here's an example. I don't even have to run it. You can just read it from here. Um, it's, a, it's just a framework, just like last framework. It's a framework, it's a nice, nice tool to run tests on your code. So here's a simple, let's say this is your functionality, increment x, okay? Given an x, uh, integer, hopefully it's an integer, and then you increment it by one, okay? Now here's a test, right? So increment, so here's a test that you, the way you write test is, uh, PyTest makes it very simple to write tests. As long as you write functions in, in some part of your folder, uh, which, you know, some file, in your, any file in your folder, uh, which just starts with test underscore whatever, okay? Test underscore any function name. Then it knows that, okay, test underscore things, I should pick up and I should actually run them, okay? So here, test underscore answer, and then we are saying assert increment of three is equal to equal to five. It should fail, right? So it's not increment of three is not five. It's the, and, and that's the test, okay, that's it. So that's the test you've written. And then every time, for example, if you make a git commit, or if you want to run it manually also, if you want to run it manually, this is how you do it. You, in the command line prompt, after you have done pip install pytest, you just type pytest. And that's it. It'll pick up that function and it says, okay, the function that that test failed. Okay. Um, you asserted this is increment three is equal to four. That means you're asserting four is equal to five, uh, which is not true. Okay. So there was one test that it picked and uh, it failed. Okay. That's, that's like a really quick introduction to Pytest. Um, any questions though? Like uh, we can actually run this as well. So I can explain a little bit more, but any questions about uh, this? So you just write a function and the test function. 
save an entire sample of py and then yeah let's actually run this right so uh, let's uh, copy this i actually have a folder for um let's say i'm just calling it my code um so let's say those are my it's calling test sample but um get rid of this yeah this is it so this is one one test uh and actually let me just go down Increment of um, okay, this one is not really a test, but okay, let's forget it. Um, just um, and then okay, let me just do this way. Um, yes, so I, I want to fail and I want to pass. So that's it. That's my. That's my. Uh, I'm. I mean, here we're just writing the functionality and the test in the same file. But you can uh, you can separate these things out. Okay. Um. So okay. So that's our. Um. I don't think PyTest is installed. So let me just install. Install it, and then I can. Um. Let's see. Uh, okay. So. PyTest by default looks for test dot test, uh, sorry, it looks for file names with the leading name test. So there's no, that's why the example had test underscore sample. Uh, but here you can just do PyTest um, uh, my code. And you can see uh, it collected two items as in two tests basically to run. And, uh, and it's showing, uh, so for the pass, it's actually showing a dot here, okay? Uh, if something passed, then it's uh, it's a it's a dot, and then then showing uh, or you, okay, forget about the dot. All you're saying is uh, the failure was what they showed in the getting started, and then one one test passed also. Okay, so given this, then you can go back and say, okay, let me just edit. Uh, uh, just change this to and assert statements. By the way, you know, it doesn't have to be inside the test type of things like this. You should have assert statements elsewhere. If you know that if you want to assert something, uh, that was given to you as input, you can say assert, uh, X is a string or is type string and so on. You should, you do those types of things. Okay. Uh, that's just defensive programming. You know, you can't trust the person giving the inputs to be exactly making X as an integer and not, not string. Right. Um, so let's make it four. Actually, here, for example, what I said is assert uh, is type x um, is equal to int okay, uh, something like this. Actually, I don't even know if that's the right. Okay, is type is not so it's was not is type is instance type or something is instance. Um, let me. Or actually, let me ignore this and let me just say assert true for simplicity. Um, so assert true is just is a backward statement; it'll it'll ignore it. So you can see that uh, if the if I fix the test, I mean, you should ideally be fixing the code, um, but the text was anyway incorrect there. I fixed the test, and so now you can see that there are two dots in stuff uh, f and f and dot, uh, and so it says uh, two passed. So I'm not saying, uh, what I'm trying to say is that there's a lot of possibilities with this tool. Uh, like last time when we sh when we saw that when you committed your training code, uh, you know, something triggered and the training was done uh, uh, using Git GitHub Actions. Similarly, when every time you commit your code, you can actually write a configuration file which will automatically trigger tests, okay? Uh, and it's always good to do that. Obviously some tests may take a lot more time and then uh, what you do is do the continuous integration, which is exactly doing testing, but on a remote machine, okay? Which is more realistic, especially if you want to access databases and things like that, uh, that makes sense. But these are local tests you can do uh, uh, using PyTest. Not just PyTest, but there are many other models. Okay. Uh, let me uh, pause here because the A-B testing part I wanted to cover, but that's 
um, um, I'll cover if, uh, you know, let's take a break for 10 minutes. And if, if there's interest, I'll cover that as well. Because uh, uh, next week I'm planning for uh, Spark and uh, streaming uh, type of um, um, applications. Yeah. Let's take a break for five, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Okay, so I have a couple of slides, but it's mostly uh, pretty straightforward. So I just want to recap at least what A-B testing is, because this is actually a big component of, uh, I mean, it's a big component of generally all software as well. Like if you have software version one and software version two, and there are so many versions, actually all of the GitHub links that you have in your project candidates, if you actually look at the uh, right hand pane you will see tags and versions and releases and so on okay so that means that they have they have done some version and then they are sprinting towards another update with more features and and uh, robustness and reliability and so on okay even airflow that we discussed if you go to airflow's github website there's so much activity uh, that's going on uh, airflow version 2 versus version 2. Point, uh, whatever 5 right um so that's just for general software for machine learning uh, generally, when you release a model, let's say it's a regression model, okay, uh, and you release a model that's predicting or uh, forecasting something, right, uh, uh, that is useful to your users, let's say tomorrow's weather, uh, and then you have another regression model, but it, it is using some extra features, okay, uh, and it's also predicting something, and you know that offline, uh, it has a better ROC or AUC or uh, any, any of these uh, metrics that you have, okay. But that's an offline evaluation. Maybe model one is better than model two or model two is better than model one. Okay. Let's say model two is better than model one. Should you then uh, release model two for all of your, you know, uh, let's say 10,000 users uh, or should you actually do more testing? That's the question. And uh, in that context, A-B testing for us basically means, uh, you know, not relying on offline metrics. Okay, that actually for, for classification, for binary classification, AUC and accuracies and so on makes sense for let's say recommendation systems, right? Recommendation systems uh, care about what's called precision and recall. Uh, and there are other measures like uh, uh, discounted cumulative gains and so on. So there are some other measures uh, that you can report for, okay, here's a new recommendation algorithm. Here's these three numbers, which are better than maybe model one. Okay, you can get those numbers offline, right? You can have a test held out data and you can report those numbers. But uh, that's not convincing, okay? Because you might have overfit your data, uh, or you might be um, missing some important feature of the real world, uh, which makes your model actually worse when you actually deploy it. Okay, so you're not gonna just because of offline numbers, you're not gonna swap model two, uh, sorry, model one with model two. Okay, what you're gonna do is actually follow the A/B testing process, where you will, um, although A/B testing in slides looks like you'll split your audience into 50-50 and actually expose model one to uh, audience one uh, or uh, one half of the audience and model two to another half of the, uh, another half of the audience and do that in a randomized way so that you actually run a what is it, essentially a randomized control trial, uh, trial. Um, and and therefore collect statistics where the only intervention is the difference is the models predictions or, or the two models and nothing else. Uh, and then therefore maybe model one is better than model two in terms of the business uh, metrics, whatever they care, whatever we care about in terms of not just precision recall or AUC or uh, binary accuracy, but actually engagement or something else, okay? uh, sale or whatever it is. Okay? Um, in reality, you don't do 50-50, you actually do a gradual, uh, you know, you actually take only 5% of your audience, hopefully it's representative of the full audience or full set of customers, and among the, you know, on that 5%, you might actually um, uh, do do your B or A uh, uh, control or treatment. And then you kind of, um, 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 you know, you can also have an, uh, you know, maybe 10% of the population, you took, take it out and then 5 and 5% 5 among, uh, 5 and 5% 5 is shown A and B respectively randomized. And then you can uh, assess whether model one is better than model. And you can gradually increase that, those proportions and so on. So there's a lot of complication that goes with uh, this. Um, for those of you who took my um, deep learning course, there was this whole idea of uh, uh, what is called bandit feedback. Okay, uh, bandit feedback is a, I guess, a new name for some of you who have not done uh, deep learning course. Is the idea that 
you only get feedback for things that you did. Okay, so let's say in the recommendation system problem, uh, you showed a uh, you showed a bunch of recommendations. You only know how people would respond to those recommendations. You don't know what would have happened if you had shown some other recommendation to the same people. It's not like classification setting where uh, if you predict a class to be cat and the true class is dog, you actually know that uh, it's not it's you know what you said is wrong. And in, in fact, if you had shown dog, you would have actually done better. Okay, and that's not a bandit setting. Okay, where you're getting actually um, uh, ground truth. Okay, of what is the best thing to do actually. Whereas in uh, many settings, you can you only know uh, you only get feedback either you know uh, in terms of sales or in terms of uh, engagement or whatever of things that you did, but you don't know what would have happened if you did not do the you know if you did something else. Okay, so. Um, that effect is what you want to kind of get rid of. And this randomization is actually one of the ways to get rid of that um, effect, okay? Um, anyway, so my point about bandits is that uh, in online settings, uh, when your models work well, uh, they are only kind of doing one type of thing. You don't know what they would have done if they did something else, okay? And so you need um, uh, randomization. And in, in the bandit, stuff that we discussed you know some of the people who took my course there was this whole thing of exploration uh where you add random noise and things like that okay so you would need to do that okay uh anyway coming back to a b testing a b testing is the simplest version of like bandits so if you, you know you should not be jumping to bandits if you, if you can't instrument a b test and it turns out even instrumenting a b tests even if you know the theory and even know even if you know how to do the statistical test and all that is very very hard okay uh, so I'm not talking about the theory of A-B testing now, I'm talking about instrumenting it. And that's why there are companies, I think some of the companies' names are listed in this slide. Optimizely is one of the big ones, but there are many other companies. Um, and uh, instrumenting it is hard because uh, of human factors and also because of software factors, okay? Human factors uh, are easy to explain. Uh, I think this is something that you might have seen in uh, if any other course that also discusses A-B testing is that people, uh, don't adhere to the testing criteria, okay? So if you want to do an A-B test and you want to detect a, an, an effect, okay? So when you do an A-B test, that means that the two options have some difference between them. And you have to guess what is the minimum difference between them and then decide how many users you're going to expose uh, to A and how many users you're going to expose to B variant, okay? How many users on control, how many users on treatment. So you need to have a sense of Oh, okay. Maybe the difference between model one and model two is three percent. And if it's three percent, maybe I need to use uh, twenty thousand users, where ten thousand users will be shown model one and twenty ten thousand users will be shown model two. Okay. You need to get those estimates first. Then you decide. Okay, I'm gonna. You know. Then you actually run your experiment where you wait till twenty thousand people effectively collect and effectively get exposed to these two, and then you actually have to stop your test and make a judgment whether there is actually a significant difference between model one and model two. Okay, uh, which is let's say some percentage. Okay, but most people, the human factor aspect. This is just an example of it. Is that people will stop the moment they see a big difference between model one and model two. Okay, so they'll stop after maybe uh, two thousand uh, visitors or two thousand customers. Uh, maybe model two seems to be better than model one. So why do we why do we even have to waste another eight thousand uh, 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 you know interactions where four thousand of them will go to the suboptimal one? Okay, so. Three, these types of re with these types of reasonings, you stop beforehand. Okay, that's a completely human factor error, which completely messes up all sorts of results. Okay, uh, so if you stop early, then your results are not valid. Okay, um, so companies are people have figured out how to change the underlying statistical machinery to let people stop early and still have valid <laughs> inferences. Okay, but that's like you know, we're not going to discuss that. But there are ways to fix it. But it's not it's not mainstream, right? The mainstream thing is we learn. In statistics, okay, this is how we do two sample hypothesis tests, and this is how we do a randomized controlled trial. And uh, if you just go with uh, uh, those types, you know, naively run A-B test, then this is a fa human factor failure that can happen. Okay. Now, uh, there are nuanced factors about software, uh, which can also lead to failure. Uh, for example, the randomization that you're doing, what if it's actually not, you know, sufficiently random? Okay. So remember, computers generate random using actually pseudo random generators okay they don't uh, unless you actually invest more effort and resources uh, they don't actually flip a coin and uh, rely on really true randomness to uh, you know segregate a and b so you may be you know the software side could be uh, introducing bias um, 
from itself just because it doesn't have access to good random sources or sometimes there is a uh, you know time lag effect for example maybe um, you want to a b test uh, you know whether um, you know whether you know when to send an email maybe you send an email tomorrow versus send an email uh, uh, one week later about hey here's a coupon for uh, coming back to our store let's say that you know your 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 model is predicting uh, customers propensity to buy if you send an email and maybe you found out okay uh, you know model one says this model two says that you know say, send later and you do that these two you know you compare these two models they're actually you know not acting at the same time right there's a weak lag and uh, that kind of influences should influence your uh, uh, um, you know statistics okay you you should not just pigeonhole into into a conventional like a two sample t, t test or something without thinking through uh, oh is there a time lag effect okay uh, that uh, you should be taking into account so anyway I, I wanted to not get into the the notes which also cover what exactly I said uh, in the in the in our repository I didn't want to show those things. So uh, I want to just mention that uh, there is a software example. Uh, it uses, uh, yeah, I'm using a tool which is kind of archived now, which is called Planout. So this is like a, uh, this is all about instrumenting A-B tests. Okay, we're not, I'm not concerned about the actual two sample test. I'm not uh, concerned about A-B test theory. Here, Planout is a, is an example tool, but uh, you know, it's like optimizely or, you know, some, you know, like other tools, actually one of the tools that one of the team chose is also related to A-B testing, perhaps. Um, it's a tool for you to um, uh, do that randomization. Okay. So when a user visit, visits your Flask app, actually, I don't know if they have a Flask example in this repository, but if a user visits a Flask app, um, uh, your Flask app, then you can have a code, you know, you can, you can pip install this this package and uh, instantiate the appropriate object so that uh, every time a user visits, when you go through the route and a function is called, you can flip a coin uh, and remember uh, this user so that the next time the user comes, they actually still go to the A option, you know, A variant rather than the control, or, you know, and they don't change their bucket. Um, and uh, and then it actually flips a coin and actually remembers that and, and shows the appropriate thing, more than small to. Okay, so how does how do you how does Flask app remember it's the same user? We don't remember anything on the on the on the our app side because every interaction is a new HTTP request. Okay, request get, request post, uh, it's it's new. So what Flask uh, can uh, or some extra functionality on Flask can do is it can it can store a cookie on the user side saying uh, so that I can know that this is this is the user. Okay, so if the same user comes, I'll read their cookie and say okay this is a, this is user one versus user one hundred. Okay, so that you can do with this uh, small example, just to get a feel for doing that instrumentation, doing the randomization of flipping a coin and showing A or B. Okay, uh, but I will not. Uh, I mean, it's there in the notes. The same package now it's uh, archived, but it's a, just a toy package. It's not for production use. It gives you a feel for how to uh, do A versus B. Okay. Any questions? Uh, I know I, it's it's just a discussion type of a treatment I made uh, about A/B testing. But any questions or Anybody done A-B testing before? Okay, uh, so as a business analyst, actually, uh, you know, it's becoming more and more common that uh, you might uh, have to kind of be involved in A-B tests, okay? Especially with companies which, which have products and services, a SaaS type of companies, they do a lot of A-B testing, uh, product testing. And, uh, and so it's good to have a good knowledge of uh, uh, whatever tool they use, whether it's Optimizely or some open source tool, uh, it's good to know how you know how it works and uh, what are the pitfalls, especially uh, because the senior leaders or whatever may not may want you to hold the experiment and you know and things like that. So uh, there's a there's a barrier between you know people who kind of can uh, the, understand the statistics and how to instrument things as well as uh, do the stats correctly and uh, what business wants. Right, the business wants the best solution to be put out there as soon as possible. Uh, that's not always, uh, you know, feasible. Okay, so let me just stop there. Uh, I didn't want to take more time than that. Um, for the next half an hour, as I said uh, earlier during the break as well, um, it'll be good if you can um, 